we're going to review the symposium on Fukushima that occurred in March in New York City under the supervision of Dr. Helen Caldecott. This may take a couple of videos to do, try to keep it under 10 minutes. The event started with Naoto Kan, who was the Prime Minister of Japan, giving a video address to the audience that was also worldwide via streaming on the internet. And basically he told us that Japan has more earthquakes than any place else on the planet. And nuclear power is never cheap energy because you have to deal with the radioactive waste. His most important comment was he told us that, quote unquote, I think that nuclear plants are not and never will be justifiable economically and will not exist in the future. In that sense, I believe that nuclear power has only existed as a transitional and temporary energy source and that the technology will not and should not exist in the next century. That's Naoto Kan, Prime Minister of Japan, during the Fukushima tsunami, earthquake, disaster, nuclear power accident that is still going on today with the leakage of 10 million becquerels per hour of cesium leaking out of the plants, especially units one through three. And he's going to be in San Diego to meet with the former head of the NRC to discuss the lessons of Fukushima for Southern California as they're trying to decide whether to reopen or not reopen the San Onofre plant that is closed right now. We have two reactors there by San Diego. The next speaker was Hiro Aki Kaoidi. I hope I pronounced that right. And he is a Master of Science in Nuclear Engineering, Assistant Professor at the Kyoto, Kyoto University Research Institute. And he gave a chronological account of the disaster. I'll try to do it quickly for you. Basically, he said that uh, the uh, units one through three were operating out of six at the time of the tsunami and earthquake. Then they all melted down. A uh, hundred tons of sintered uranium con ceramic in the core fell onto the bottom of what he called a pressure cooker and soon broke through the pressure vessel, fell onto the floor of the nuclear reactor containment vessel, which seals off the radiation as the last protective wall in a nuclear reactor. And this continued to break the containment vessel at various spots, one after the other and the lost protective walls which seals in the radiation and radiation began releasing this to the environment. At the same time, hydrogen was produced and this produced explosions of the, several of the buildings. And as these materials were dissolving in the water, they were also going into the ground and into the ocean. And uh, as of today, he said, 10 million people live in radiation controlled areas and are exposed to continual radiation every day. At the bottom of fuel pool 4, the building exploded, but the, uh, the fuel um, pool, which is 100 feet above the ground, is still in a dangerous situation. And he says there's about 10,000 Hiroshima bombs of fuel at the bottom there. And they are uh, exposed to the environment every day. And there are aftershocks almost daily in the vicinity of the, the Daiichi plant. That's the name of the plant at Fukushima where the six reactors are. And if there's a, an earthquake, he said, they won't be able to do anything about it. And TEPCO is aware they're trying to remove all the material at the bottom. They hope to start removing it at the end of 2013. Uh, they ex and he expects a lot of workers to be exposed to the radiation while this is attempted. He says, I have to live in a contaminated world. Haroaki Koidi. Okay, then we had Arnie Gunderson, and he was has worked in the nuclear industry for a long time. 
and he gave us an account of what they knew when they knew it. He wanted to tell us first that a tsunami, tsu, T-S-U means harbor, nami means waves, so tsunami. And a tsunami travels up to 539 miles per hour, that's greater than the speed of sound, and it heights up to 165 feet, and they have very long wavelengths of up to 124 miles. And the periods between a tsunami wave when one is generated or some are generated can be between 10 and 60 minutes. I only wanted to thank the workers who saved the world, he said. They're his personal heroes and he has profound respect for them. And about hundreds, hundreds of people were responsible to prevent the calamity from being much worse at Fukushima. We have 22 similar reactors in the United States, by the way, and here we have more spent fuel in their fuel pools compared to what they have now, or what they had then at Daiichi. Now, he gave us a quick history of the Mark I, going back into the 50s and 60s in the United States. It was designed in the United States, and the one that was erected at Daiichi, the first one, had no Japanese input. And what happened was General Electric got the contract to build nuclear reactors on a turnkey contract, so it took $60 million. They had to build at least 12 and then this one. And they lost their shirt. I already said he knows because he worked on them. He worked at the one in Millstone in Connecticut. And there were a lot of economic pressures on, Gen on uh, General Electric to keep the cost down because they were losing money dramatically. Going back into Arnie's history of the Mark I, General Electric's motto was progress is our most important product. Their CEO said in 1961, we're going to ram this nuclear thing through. The Atomic Energy Commission had an advisory committee on nuclear safeguards but in 1966, because of the economics of their turnkey contract, they threatened that they'd have to go out of business if the Safeguards Committee enforced the safeguards. And the chairman of the committee, Glenn Seaborg, admitted, I don't think we had the power to stop them. So the U.S. government didn't have the power to stop General Electric's faulty design in 1966. So in 1972, when they were starting up Daiichi, their senior safety officer, Joseph Henry, Hendry, H-E-N-D-R-I-E, said that the acceptance of pressure suppression containment concepts by all elements of the nuclear field is firmly embedded in the conventional wisdom. Reversal of this hollow policy, particularly at this time, could well be the end of nuclear power. It would throw into question the continued operation of licensed plants and would generally create more turmoil than I can stand thinking about. Joseph Henry, AEC Chief Safety Officer. So he felt they should be eliminated. But the turmoil that the AEC and America chose to avoid in 1972 became the turmoil that occurred at Daiichi in 2011.